are pretty on Ulysses. There it is. Well, good morning. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I just had a sip of my second cup of coffee three seconds before I pushed record, and I think it was the most delicious sip of coffee of my life. What's up with that? It's the same Starbucks coffee I have been drinking all week, and uh, I just polished off a cup, but this... is transportive. So, that bodes well for a lively Friday reads, don't you think? I have had a pretty good reading week. Yeah, it's been a good reading week. I don't have a lot of news because I haven't finished a whole bunch or whatever, but uh, I'll tell you all about it. So it's uh, intermittently rainy and very cold this morning, so no al fresco videos. I bailed on one book, and this will not come as a surprise. It was later the same day that I filmed last Friday's Friday Reads, Guapa by Salim Haddad. Uh, for all the reasons I talked about there, it was overly earnest didn't grab me, didn't care for the writing, found it just almost cringeworthy. I mean, and, and, and too bad. I mean, lots of people love it, so that's great. But for me, it was a bad novel about an important topic, gay love in the Middle East. And uh, yeah, just didn't work for me at all. So I read about 10 more pages, maybe only six last Friday and gave, gave up. So Ollie still loves me, he says. We talked about replacing it with something this month, but because uh, he wasn't, I don't think he had quite as negative a reaction as to it as I did. Go figure. But he didn't sound like he was overly thrilled with it. Instead, we're just going to have a non-buddy read and just check in with each other about what we're reading and what's going on in our lives in lieu of a buddy read for April, and that'll be great. But this was not. <laughs> And I have only finished one book, and that was Vita Sackville West's 1931 novel, All Passion Spent. I think I had started, I'd read 10 pages when I checked in with you last Friday, and I loved those 10 pages. I loved, it was divided into three sections. The first and third sections were quite long, like 75 pages each. The middle section was... 25. Section 1 was a tour de force. I absolutely loved it. It made me so excited to have finally read Vita Sackville West and for her to have ended up being so much better of a novelist than I ever would have dreamt she was from everything I've heard about her writing. She's kind of like a Dorothy Parker. Her genius was in her life, not in her art. Uh, by the end, I'm sorry to say, I think that's actually true. Her genius was in her life and not in her art. This was not a very good novel at all. For me, wide variety of opinions out there, it failed pretty much utterly for me. I gave it a three star because section one was so strong, but let me rant a little because I don't have uh, much else to talk about in today's Friday Reads. This is about an 88-year-old um, Lady Slain. Her husband used to be the Prime Minister. He died, killed over at opening pages, age 94. She has old children. Most of them are married. Um... And they uh, want to take care of her or they want to boss her around. And she announces within the first 24 to 48 hours after the Earl's death that she has her own ideas. And so she moves far from her current house into a little house that she once admired something like 30 or 40 years ago in Hampstead Heath and moves with her a French maid, Janu, who is almost as old as she is. And... That story is laid out for us in section one in a way that was just delightful to read. I loved her. I loved her unexpected feistiness, which just mortified her family. And I loved her daughter, Edith, the unmarried one, who seemed to be quite independent. I was intrigued by this one of the sons, Kay, who had weird collecting hobbies. Um, what did he collect? Weird stuff. Musical instruments or something? I can't remember. Um, but the other children were really staid and obnoxious and delightfully so. 
Section 2 was one of the worst uh, reading experiences of the last few years. She tried to emulate her girlfriend Virginia's stream of consciousness, and it was a complete fail. It was just like pulling teeth to get me to finish those, for me to finish those 25 pages. And that was her newly ensconced in her new smaller home in Hampstead Heath, reflecting back on her life. And it was just so poorly done, and it was just uh, drudgery to read to show why she'd married her husband and why she'd made um, various decisions in her life and the fact that she was a frustrated artist. All of that was important information, but just very badly narrated. It was just terrible to read. Part three, I was hoping it would go back to the joyful narration and pl playful delightfulness of part one, but it didn't do that enough. An old man not quite as old as her, an eccentric millionaire, Mr. Fitzgeorge, pays her an unexpected visit. She doesn't remember him. He met her briefly a hundred years before in India and had carried a torch for her ever since. He had seen into her soul and told her all about it. So he reiterates a lot of the insight that we get from her, that horrible section two uh, stream of consciousness about her being a frustrated artist and having just given up her true personality to be in this marriage with her husband. And he confronts her with it and she is at first resistant to, I mean, she's also got some dementia. It's like she keeps kind of fading in and out of present day awareness and she's very old. Didn't really like how that was handled in the novel, actually, but I won't uh, spend more time talking about that. I just felt that he, this Mr. Fitzgeorge, was aggressively mansplaining Lady Slane to herself, and that the novel didn't really take her identity seriously until Mr. Fitzgeorge had really obnoxiously mansplained it to her. And that made me really angry. Now, I was buddy reading this with Leah from Calgary. She didn't have that reaction. She didn't think it was mansplaining. I Maybe I'm sensitive to mansplaining these days. I'm not sure. But I uh, really, that really bothered me. There was just so much potential in this novel. The really interesting, in a positive or negative sense, the really interesting children she had, they barely appear in the second half. Like, Edith is one of the most interesting, the spinster daughter, was one of the most interesting characters in modern fiction, and she barely shows up after that first chapter. What a waste! And the relationship between Lady Slane and this millionaire guy who ends up, uh, I won't say it, I don't think we need to care too much about spoiling a novel that was written 90 years ago, but anyway... Uh, stuff happens in section 3 that I thought was just ridiculous, and it just twisted the plot in a really uninteresting way. And I like the ending, the last few pages, spoiler alert, she dies, but um, that was fairly well done. But I wasn't moved by anything, really, after section 1. I just thought it was not well done. So, Cousin loved it. Cousin and I may be talking about it when we meet. And other people, you know, uh, lots of other people really, really liked or loved it, but I thought it was just okay. It really, it would have been a two or a one star read, except for the strength of the first 75 page section. So, quite disappointing. <laughs> oh yes, and I did finish this short story last week, Sylvia Plath's Mary Ventura and the Ninth Kingdom, and I didn't like the ending at all. Um, there is a review discussion video. Uh, that Doris and I made uh, on our channels. I'll put a link below, but yeah, this fizzled out for me completely. I think I gave it three stars. I'm not sure. All right. On to happier news. It's always happier, the things I start. It's when I get around to finishing them that all the negativity comes in. I have started this collection of short stories from Australia, Foreign Soil by Maxine Benham Clark, and... I would say my reaction is positive. I've read two stories. The first one I really liked and the second one I didn't like at all. So that's pretty typical for uh, a short story collection. 
these are all about non-white Australians, and yeah, I've heard really good things about it. Eager to continue. This week's uh, Faber Stories selection that Doris and I will are discussing is Juna Barnes's The Lydia Step Stow. Huh? The Lydia Stepto series. And it is a, actually a collection of three stories, maybe? Yeah. Three very short stories in this slim volume. I have read only the first eight pages of the first story, which was enough for me to film my preliminary reaction and send it off to Doris, and that's as far as I've got. But I didn't think I would like these based on other brief experiences with Juna Barnes's writing, but I loved the first half of the first story, so that bodes well. And probably the most positive news I have on the reading front from this week is that I've now got a good start on Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. It's incredible! Everybody and their dog has said it's incredible. They were right! I'm uh, 50 pages in. I just love it. Mesmerizing. So this is a very positive aspect of my reading that's new to tell you about this week. I abandoned the audiobook. I I'm sorry about Toni Morrison's voice, but it's just it just sounds like she runs out of gas at the end of each sentence, and it's just almost painful to listen to. So I'm just reading it myself and uh, really, really enjoying it. It's just incredible. So that's what I've started. Just to, to, to mention, I really expected to finish this up this week. This is the Australian novella Hang Him When He's Not There by Nicholas John Turner. And also the Irish debut novel Leonard and Hungry Pete. Is that right? Leonard and Hungry Pete by Ronan Hessian. And I have not been able to finish them. And that's just interesting. So just as a, by way of commentary, there's just they're both short little books. This is 150 pages and the Irish one is... 200 pages it's not that I didn't have time to finish them but when they're this good and this one is very mixed some chapters I'm actually hating passionately but uh, it's still a really strong debut um, having much more of a consistently positive experience with Leonard and Hungry Pete but I'm enjoying them so much I'm so engrossed that I don't want to rush and this is what often happens with me when I'm reading good books I don't want to finish them. I don't want to spend the whole day finishing a book. I want to read 20 pages today and 20 pages tomorrow and let those sink in. Let me. I want to process them and think about them. So I, I, I hope to finish these these two, this one and this one, um, before I talk to you next Friday. But maybe I won't. But because I haven't finished them, now the, the commitments for the coming week are going to really pile on to my reading situation but the more the merrier right so in terms of what's coming up uh, oh and uh sophie van lewin's bottled goods i can't put my finger on my little paper copy so i'll just put the picture up here um i didn't start it again because these two little novels novellas i just haven't finished so i maybe i'll start that next week but this will be the third week that i promised to start it so i'm not even going to promise Today I am starting this buddy read with Anne from Beyond the Pages and Heidi from My Reading Life. Rachel Ferguson's, I think this is also a 1931 novel, The Brontes Went to Woolworths. And I hear it's really kooky. I think Leah told me that and I first found out about it. I actually can't remember whether it was the Book of Forgotten Authors or the Barbara Pym biography, but anyway. I'm assuming that I will polish this off in the next uh, few days with those lovely people. And next Thursday, I believe, there's a group of us buddy reading this debut from Australia, Flames by Robbie Arnott. came out late last year, and I'm buddy reading this with Anna Bailey Karras. I will actually be a guest on her podcast talking about this book coming up soon. Uh, unless I bail. I'm not going to bail because... Uh, my name should be Sean Bailey Mooney. <laughs> anyway, bad pun, Anna. I'm sorry. So I'm reading it with Anna and subscriber Joe, who, Joe Smith, who you all know and love because she comments on every single video that every booktuber puts up every day. She's just wonderful. I don't know how she finds time to read. She's such a wonderful commenter. And uh, Tina of Valentin Garcia, I think is her channel name. 
us four will be reading this starting next Thursday. So I'm, I'm not sure this is ultimately going to be a Sean book. I think there's some magical realism or something in it. So sometimes that hits me right. Most of the time it doesn't. So I'm going to go into it with an open mind. And because I'm going to be on Anna's podcast, I can't bail. I won't bail. I promise. You've heard me promise such things before. And here, as a guest on our podcast, is Sean the Book Maniac to discuss why he bailed on the book we're talking about today. Doesn't that sound like a fabulous concept? (laughs) All right, so that's the kind of reading week it's been. How has it been where you are? Thanks for watching.